Uh, time for Canucks conversation. This on Wednesday, February 28th, after the Vancouver Canucks drop a game to the Pittsburgh Penguins in overtime. Canucks conversation is brought to you by the all new 2023 Toyota BZ4X. The BZ4X is Toyota's brand new all electric SUV that is designed to go the distance for you and your family. The BZ4X is packed with Toyota's coolest tech but it has that trusty SUV feel you know and love. And even though it's electric, it's capable of effortlessly conquering any terrain, whether it's rain, snow, mud, or your friend's questionable post-game recaps. The BZ4X will get you through. We are coming to you live from the iconic Wall Center in downtown Vancouver. Looking for your next meeting space? Contact the Wall Center for all your event needs at sales at wallcenter.com. Alongside Harmon Dial, I'm Rafon Gaffar here with you. Harm, you went to the game last night against the Pittsburgh Penguins. The Canucks lose in overtime. They led that game twice. What are your takeaways from that one? Disappointing, obviously, considering how strong they were out of the gate. They were dominant in that first period. Seriously, watching them, I was thinking, okay, they're just going to steamroll Pittsburgh in this one. Uh, They were creating scoring chances at will. And when I know the Canucks are rolling at the absolute peak of their game is when they're creating rush chances in bunches. Because the Canucks aren't a team that usually does that. If they're doing that, I think, A, that's a sign of how connected they are as a team on the breakout. But also, B, that the Penguins have this season statistically been one of the NHL's worst teams at defending the rush. So Canucks go up 2-0. Obviously, Hoaglander has that beautiful rebound goal, which, again, has sort of been the bread and butter, right? Uh, low to high, recover pucks, funnel it to the point, just create chaos in front of the net uh, and score that way. And then the balanced power play units, yes. which we didn't have a lot of confidence <laughs> in, that came through. And you go into the first intermission, and you're thinking this is going to be pretty easy. Canuck should walk away with uh, with this one. And then it's just sloppy. It's careless in the second period. Um, and in the third, a lot of penalties, turnovers. It, it seemed to fall apart. What did you notice in terms of why they maybe fell off in in the second and third periods? Turnovers. I mean, Rick Tockett said it after the game. It was a turnover fest and the Canucks won. And that's probably why they lost the game. I mean, careless penalties. But that's kind of been the trend for the Vancouver Canucks here over the last little bit has been careless penalties. They're making bad mistakes, mental errors that they're not usually making, which is why the puck ends up in the back of your net. I mean... You can't put that one on Thatcher Demko. The guy made enough brilliant saves for his team to win the hockey game. JT Miller, we'll get to him in just a second. JT Miller was unreal in that game, but he did say after the game that, you know, this team basically, you know, is still finding their maturity. And at some point, when you look at it, we talked about this team very early on in the season and the way that they were going through things, Harmon. I was like, you know what? I was one of the first to say, maybe this team is maturing before eyes, but now you have guys that say it. And we're getting into that part of the season where you kind of got to know who you are and where you're at as a team and as an organization. And from JT Miller's perspective, I don't think he thinks that they still have it. I've seen a lot of growth yeah. this season. And yeah, they need to nip this in the bud, but we've seen way more good than we have seen bad in terms of them holding on to leads and and for the most part playing responsibly. Like it's been a night and day difference compared to last year, even as we discuss turnovers. And I mean, the one that Teddy Bluger had, you just can't do that when Sidney Crosby's on the ice in no. your defensive zone. <laughs> that's uh, like unacceptable completely. Right. Yeah. That has creeped into games. And over the stretch, when the Canucks go up a goal or two, you don't have the same level of confidence as you did early in the season that they're going to lock it down. But also this is part of today's NHL that, yeah. Two goal leads aren't safe for anyone. No. I mean, think of all the problems Boston's had lately with, with holding leads. It's anytime a team is losing, even top ones, it you, blown leads are usually part of the conversation because you're not going to win most games 2 1 or, or, or even as often 3 2 anymore. Uh, yeah. And you need to correct it, but I'm still looking at the big picture and I'm thinking my confidence has been completely shot. Uh, in this group, they just need to get back on the rails. Okay, but what do you get them back on the rails? They In their last 14 games, they have three regulation wins. Yes. <laughs> You've collected points, which is great, and they've won some of the games, but just three in regulation. It's a rough stretch, but again, every team goes through it. Honestly, look at a team like Colorado. Uh, at least at a couple points in the season, they have been in shambles where 
uh, players internally are are calling each other out. I mean, look at how many teams have gone through mini cri- uh, gone through a mini crisis this year. Colorado has, LA has, Edmonton's gone through two, <laughs> Boston's going through one right now. It happens. I mean, Vegas has been scuffling now. Obviously, injuries, injuries are, big, yeah. are a big part of that. But it happens even for the even for the top teams. The key is you got to make sure that you correct it by the time the playoffs start. Okay. Well, we're gonna get to this because I want to talk about a player that you know, has been unreal for the Vancouver Canucks of late, and that's been JT Miller. A lot of smoke around him. He signed the big contract, the extension here for the Vancouver Canucks. Now, a lot of people question that and the contract and things like that. But to be completely honest, he's been as advertised, and he's probably exceeded a lot of people's expectations, hasn't he? For sure. He's blown expectations out uh, out of the water. Do you remember before the coaching change, he was a whipping boy? Yeah. And people didn't have confidence in him. I didn't have confidence that he was going to be able to live up to that contract, not necessarily in the short term, but just the back half of the deal. I was like, boy, that could be a potential anchor. He's cleaned up his two-way play, and he's become such a strong offensive driver at 5-5. Five and five. He's been their best forward this year, and I'm sure we're going to get into the MVP debate. Is he, your, is he your MVP this year? Team MVP? I think it's a battle of him and Hughes. I think it it, it changes. Hughes always he gets points. He's on the ice a lot, but... JT Miller of late and for the most part this season, you know, they have really good players. They've got Quinn Hughes, they've got Elias Pettersson, they've got Thatcher Demko, they've got Brock Pester, who all having remarkably good seasons. JT Miller is the heartbeat of that team. I really do believe that. I think that what he says, a lot of people do listen to in the locker room when he does speak, if you want to believe it or not. Um, and I also think that, you know, the coach trusts him and obviously likes him a lot when he singled him out last night. For sure. Even in a game like that, Pittsburgh scores on the five on three. Imagine what the situation looks like if he doesn't get that back with a shorthanded goal. And what hand eye that was to once Pedersen from the half wall sort of deflected the puck into space for Miller to sort of engage in that in that battle, sort of bat it up and then swipe it past Latang midair and then snipe one past Chari. That's one of the coolest sequences of um of the season. But as we discuss MVP I still think it's recency bias to call him the MVP for the entire season just because with Quinn Hughes he's been responsible for the best top pair in the NHL yep you look at the goal differential plus 31 I I dove into the numbers uh just last week Vancouver's top pair was the best in the NHL statistically for as great as JT Miller has been I don't think anybody is calling his line the best line in hockey no Right, there's still McKinnon up there. There's still McDavid up there. Kucherov's been doing his thing. Uh, Plus, I'll say this: I think Hughes Hughes's transition game unlocks what the forwards can do. Because think about how many times he breaks the puck out, allows the Canucks to establish offensive zone possession, and then the forwards are able to do their thing, create chances, score goals. But unless Hughes is assisting on them, he's not getting credit for getting them from point A in the defensive zone to point B in the offensive zone, essentially functioning as a one-man breakout machine. You take that lever out of um, of this team's uh, blue line, and I think it would completely fall apart in terms of their transition game. Yeah, I agree with you on the recency bias. It probably is Hughes in for all accounts, but I think that JT Miller, JT Miller's name is now coming up in conversations yes. just because of what he's been playing. There's no chance. I think Quads tweeted out, there's no chance that he's the Hart Trophy. That he's going to win the Hart Trophy. I like it. It's a cool story, but there's no way. There's too many guys ahead of him that are having insane seasons. And if you're battling the guy on your team for team MVP, chances are you're probably not going to win the Hart Trophy. But it is a good story. I mean, the Vancouver Canucks have two. You could even say that, you know, Demko's up there as well. He's probably near the top for the Vesna Trophy. Elias Pettersson's having remarkably are going to score 30 goals as well. And then the season that Brock Besser is having with eclipsing 34 last night as well um more on jt miller that that play that that sequence that you mentioned i think for him to go and i think it just showed the confidence that he had when he went and just sniped that puck by by jari there definitely i'll also say this he's i really think he saved their their bacon in the sense of masking and i mean it's still a talking point but man they've got to clean up their discipline Oh yeah, They're taking way too many penalties since the All-Star break. The Canucks have taken the most penalties in the NHL. You also look at, and th- there's two sides of the coin when we discuss their 
issues with discipline right now. One is, I think they're, one is just carelessness, right? Especially with the forwards. I didn't like Pedersen's high sticking penalty in third period. I didn't like Brock's hooking penalty in third period. Those aren't, uh, not, not that any penalty is, is a quality penalty, but some, if you're saving a goal potentially in the defensive zone, you're like, okay, that's a penalty worth taking. Those penalties, when you're in the offensive zone, you're just battling in the neutral zone, are not worthwhile penalties to be taking. But then the other side of the coin is that this this um, team just has, a, especially on the blue line, has a long track record of um, of being undisciplined. I'm looking at it right now. Worst penalty differential in the NHL this season right now. Tyler Myers at minus 19 is number one. Nikita Zadorov at minus 17 is number two. And Ian Cole at um, minus 13 is tied for sixth. And they were two of those guys were in the box at the same time for one of the goals. <laughs> That's half your blue line. Yeah. But they've done this year in and year out. All three of those guys, Myers, Zadorov, Cole, this happens every year. And I think part of it is just that's their play style. Uh, that's one of the weaknesses in their game. You're not changing that. So to me, the responsibility falls on the forwards that you've got to stop with some of these stick penalties because you know you have a blue line that's been constructed in a way where they're going to have certain strengths and weaknesses. And one of the weaknesses is they take a lot of penalties. That's just mental and discipline, right? I, it's not one of those things that you can teach or you can get someone to do differently. It's just a player that has, has to go out and be thinking, just not put yourself in that situation where referees are going to call penalties. And I know that fans and a lot of people are always on the refs or calling soft penalties on the Vancouver Canucks and things like that. Yeah, but if you're taking the most penalties in the league since the All-Star break, at some point it's not on the officiating. For sure. It's also what undid... You know, a team like uh, the Minnesota Wild in the playoffs mm -hmm. last year, they complained about the officiating um, all all the time through the regular yeah. season last year. It didn't change come playoff time, and they got torched because of that. They couldn't kill penalties off uh, against Dallas. And in a game like that, the Canucks were actually lucky that Pittsburgh's power play has been terrible all year, bottom three in the NHL. If that happens in the playoffs in round two against Edmonton, you give them a two-minute <laughs> five-on-three, that's the game. Yeah. That's curtains. You do that against Vegas, Colorado, Colorado. That's I think coming out of this game and overall, I'm not panicking about this stretch. I think this team will get back on track. Just look at the standings. We know that they're a really, really good team. They're, they're legit cup, cup contenders in my mind, but if we're discussing big picture and their ability to actually contend going into the playoffs, that's, one of the concerns you have to address is a you take a lot of penalties and b your shorthanded play is still uh, inconsistent. Yeah, no, absolutely. And after the game, I know Rick Talkett talked today about some stuff as well. But after the game last night, I just want to get back to it. Um, here's what Rick Talkett had to say about the Canucks and, and their penalty taking. We did not dominate the second period. I can tell you that. We need some individuals to up their game. You know, just just you know, there's some guys who are just okay. It's been okay for a while, and they gotta, you know, you gotta contribute. If it's not goals and assists, it's make sure you get the puck in deep, or you're good uh, defensively. You just, you know, um, you know, I think we're just been a little sloppy. I don't know if it's a tired team, but uh, you know, we got this. The, you know, the schedule's gonna favor us in the sense we're not gonna be playing as many games loaded right now so hopefully uh we get some guys legs back and, and some of the brains back again you know because uh, we're a little sloppy well i just thought there was some sloppy stuff you know um detailed stuff there was you know some guys look tired out there to be honest with you but it was uh you know even when we're up three to two on that you know we give them that goal bad coverage you know um yeah i i didn't think a lot of guys there's a lot of average guys out there you know millsy Trove to play again today. I thought Millsy was great, you know, very, very good today. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot there from Rick Tockett about different things and and what his he does and he doesn't like about this team. And the one I the one quote I like there is a paraphrase, but got to get our brains back. So they have some time to to rest and relax. But now time for the Wendy's Daily Faceoff Survivor Pool game. Wendy's is letting you win real food with your fantasy teams this year and Daily Faceoff. For those of you who smoke the competition, Wendy's is rewarding you with weekly prizes that'll have you winning. Download the Wendy's app and score yourself 150 bonus rewards points on your first order and grab a sweet victory from the mouth-watering jaws of defeat. 
along with some fresh, never frozen beef. Sign up to play daily face-off to win weekly prizes like the spicy chicken sandwich from Wendy's and the Wendy's app. As we welcome in our guest, NHL insider Frank Saravalli. Frank, I've never been a big math guy, but I do believe the last time we did this, we, you and I made a bet. The Canucks would play 500 hockey or better every month the rest of the way. I'm here to let you know that you owe me dinner. I don't think it was every month. You can go back and replay the clip I said to close out the season. It was every yes, month. No. It was, it was it was every month the rest of the way. Hmm. My flight to wherever you are is going to be cheaper than your dinner. I just want to let you know that. Hmm. We're going to go okay. back. We're, we're going to go back. We're going to find it. Yeah, we're going to need to see the tape on this. Okay, I'm excited. So I'm, I'm, throwing the, I'm throwing the challenge flag. All right. Well, we'll get back to it. And we'll definitely... I'm happy to pay because I don't you unlike the guys on uh, Barn Burner on Flames Nation. I don't welch on my bets, <laughs> so I'm happy to pay. All right, get I'm going. in. Um, I want to get started with you right away on something that's been one of the biggest issues and and biggest talking points in this city over the last few days, and that's the the talking or the lack thereof, and what's happening with Elias Pettersson. From your understanding, as we sit here and where we are right now on Wednesday. February 28th, where is it at? Quiet. The Canucks are certainly frustrated. I think they would have liked this to have this wrapped up months ago, back in November, December at the latest. I think all-star break came and went, and now we're on the precipice of the trade deadline. And, man, it would make life a lot easier if you knew what your spending was like next season in terms of targeting players to potentially acquire that has term. And that's the biggest line item for the Canucks cap next season, unquestionably, and it's not done. So where do we stand right now? I think it's just at a standstill. It's nothing happening in terms of the Canucks getting an answer. And I think that's the part that is really bothering them. They're saying, well, we've put the money on the table. We're willing to work with you on term, whatever it is. Just tell us, we'll work with you four years, five years, eight years, whatever the case. And it's more or less been a stiff arm, a, Hey, let's, let's put this off for a bit from the Pedersen camp. And that's the uncertainty of it. I think is what's driving everyone crazy. Frank, I think there is a portion of the fan base that is looking at Pedersen before the season started saying, I'm not going to worry about this until the end of the season. And a lot of fans are thinking, well, hold on. All he's doing is following through on his word that he doesn't really want to negotiate through the season. Why is this such a talking point? Uh, what would your sort of response to that perspective be? It's probably the healthiest way to be a fan. <laughs> Um, I would say the one part of this discussion that has, I think to me, been an unfair talking point has been the idea that the Canucks are getting calls on Pedersen. Like, let me just reiterate for you, like zero, a, there is a 0% chance that the Vancouver Canucks are trading Elias Pedersen before March 8th at 3 p.m. Zero. So I think throwing that log on the fire probably doesn't help. Um, any team can call anyone about anyone at any time, and I get it. Um, but that, to me, was where we kind of jumped the shark. And so I think from a fan perspective, first off, enjoy the ride. Like, I wouldn't tell anyone how to be a fan, but enjoy it because your team has made some huge strides You've put yourselves in the conversation to be a true authentic contending team with a chance to win the Stanley Cup. And whatever happens this summer, it's significantly consequential, but that's a long ways off. And before we speculate on what Pedersen may or may not be thinking, let me tell you this. The truth is no one really knows. Even some of Pedersen's closest friends, I've talked to some of his teammates in the last week. They don't know what he's thinking. He doesn't say much about it. And he's also a pretty introverted guy. I heard some speculation today coming out of Toronto that, 
well, maybe Pedersen doesn't want to resign because he doesn't like JT Miller. And while I think there's probably a kernel of truth there that Pedersen and Miller are not close and are not friends, I also, my understanding of the situation is that it's been a lot more copacetic. It's been a lot better on that front this year and that JT Miller has, has shown um, you're talking about his game. He's shown some growth in terms of a leadership perspective off the ice. So there's a lot to unpack, but that's my understanding of the situation right now. It's funny you mentioned that. I mean, that's been a talking point for a very long time here. Just locally was the relationship obviously between those two and, and, and other players. But I mean, Frank, you know, as well as anyone, like, I mean, you don't need to be, friends on best friends everyone doesn't need to like each other to go and win a stanley cup if you have the common if you have a common goal of that now i think that those two are mature enough to realize that and realize what they have but just one more on elias Pettersson before we move things where are things at from his camp because yes he's talked about in the summer not wanting to talk about it until the, the season's been over now all this stuff kind of from the canucks saying that they've been disappointed from elias Pettersson's side of you and from his camp what are they saying so they're not saying much, if anything. And the other part I would add is, and not to, you know, drill down on semantics, but did he say he wasn't going to talk this season or did he say that he was not in a rush? I mean, I'm actually asking the question. Well, I think he said that he wasn't, he, he didn't want to talk until the end of the year. Did, did he say that or did he say he wasn't in a rush? Wasn't it, I'm not talking until the end of the season? I'm pretty sure that's, that's what it was. I have to go back and look because I honestly don't remember all of the reporting ins and outs. My understanding of it, and I think the Canucks' understanding of it was, hey, I, I'm not, this isn't something that needs to be done before the season starts. Some players come in and they say, I don't want to put my skates on the ice in training camp without <laughs> a new contract done. So... I do think that there is a line of distinction, so to speak, between um, what all that means. But if he did say that and is being true to his word, why wouldn't the Canucks take him at that word in the beginning of the year? I think a fair question to ask. Well, that's the thing. And, and I think that that's why, from the Canucks' point of view, when we look at it, is where you can say the Canucks are kind of disappointed that actually nothing has happened here because... You're right. The money's on the table. They want to make him one of probably the highest paid players in the league. And it's going to be something that we're going to have to talk about for quite some time. Um, something else that I wanted to get to you as well about that has interest to people in these parts. He's, hey, just, just to clarify real quick, I want to read you the exact quote um, before we go any further, just for pure clarity. To my knowledge, I don't know that he said anything about not talking during the year. This is, this is exactly what he said to Elliot Friedman on August 23rd. I got one more year left over there, and I don't want to rush into anything because I still don't know if it's going to be short-term or long-term. It's going to probably be, be probably my biggest contract so far, so I don't want to stress anything. It Where's didn't the say there that he wasn't going to talk during the season. He just said, I'm not in a rush. So I think that's an important distinction to make if we're just going to talk about statements. Now, there is an NHL.com article from Kevin Woodley, January 19th, where he was asked about it, and he said, wait until the end of the year. So Okay. Just putting that in there. Yeah, so I think that's, I mean, look, maybe the beginning of the year they thought there was something, and then now things have changed a little bit where he doesn't want to talk to the end of the season. Anyways, it's one of the biggest things that's happening, and a lot of people use obviously. Oh, and it's all, I mean, let, like, let's dive into the nuance of it. That's all, like, my whole point was, like, your market is on fire and ablaze with this exact conversation right now, and I just wanted to be accurate on exactly what we're talking about because I do think there's a lot of stuff thrown at the wall, too, right now. No, 100%. But that's why we have you on to be able to, you know, clean up the stuff off the wall a little bit and to make things clear for not only us, but for people that don't really know what's going on, to be completely fair. So, yeah, I mean, it is quiet from both parts. The Canucks are a little bit upset and the, we'll see if they they decide to talk about it at the end of the season or what happens there. But another player, there's there's a couple on the trade board that or the trade watch that, that I want to get to you about. And the one has a lot of interest in these parts. So that's Chris Tanev. What's the latest there? 
The Calgary Flames are basically holding an auction. <laughs> He's up for the first bidder that puts a first round pick on the table. I've been reporting that for a couple of weeks now that look, uh, they've got multiple teams that have offered a second round pick. There's some different and intriguing options on the table. If you're talking about what those second round picks are, and I'll give you an example as to the disparity. And that's the Winnipeg Jets, they hold the Montreal Canadiens second round pick. So if you're thinking of quality of pick, maybe they're one of the leaders in the clubhouse on the TANF front. But it's also, if if no one is going to put up a first, part of what Calgary is trying to do is squeeze on every other part of it. Hey, can we make this a conditional second that can become a first if you get to whatever round they deem important? Can you add in a prospect? Does this team that's in the mix need salary retention? These are all the things that that Calgary is working on. And Vancouver is still very much in the mix. Um, I believe there's somewhere between 8 to 10 authentic teams that have uh, been in touch with Calgary that really want to get their hands on Tanev. And they're going to just more or less wait until... It's like kind of like think about eBay. It's like wait until someone hits the buy it now price to grab Tana for a late first round pick. There's been a lot of discussion in these parts about JT Miller right now. He's having a phenomenal stretch. I, I want to go back to Jim Rutherford and Patrick Alvin's first real offseason when they essentially picked JT Miller over Bo Horvat in terms of who to prioritize for an extension. Why do you, th what gave them that level of confidence to pick JT over Bo? Because it's obviously from a Canucks perspective, aging really well. Well, it is. And I think part of the sort of angst and or consternation that existed mm, 13 months ago before the Horvat trade was, you remember, think back to where Bo was in December and January scoring at a pace that he'd never been before. I think he was traded with 29 goals in 34 games. And basically the question at that time was, would the Canucks be willing to trade a premium or pay a premium to keep Bo Horvat? And the answer was no. Um, so not only was the right call made then, but also just in terms of look before we go on giving them too much credit, like to be fair, they were really aggressively trying to move JT Miller last year at the deadline too. And that thing with Pittsburgh, I've got to confirm from multiple sources was a very real thing. Um, so depends on how you want to slice it. I think Miller has been unquestionably ridiculous this year. I think he's this month in particular as the rest of the Canucks have sort of sagged a little bit around him. He's been the one driving force. You heard Rick Tockett mention it again. He's a guy that kind of just drags your team into the fight and is I've made my jokes this year, uh, even going back to the skills competition saying the 11 best players in the world and JT Miller, which I still got a Canucks fan tweeting me last week saying you owe JT Miller an apology. Shame on you. <laughs> and I was just like, I mean, I'm, I'm still pretty confident in my take that JT Miller is not one of the 12 best players in the world, but he's certainly been damn good for the Canucks this year and not only worth every penny, but that contract extension really even the last couple years of it, it's not going to matter because he's been that good so far. To follow up on that, I was talking to a couple of my friends who were uh, who are Penguins fans uh, just with these two teams meeting and the idea of those rumors at last year's deadline about Miller and in those potential conversations uh, with the Penguins uh, discussing a potential trade were resurfacing and we were thinking, oh, how different could things have been if uh, if Miller had been traded to Pittsburgh? Can you walk us through just how serious it got? Because um, like it is with. Brock best or sometimes the best trades are ultimately the ones that you don't make. Yeah. yeah. I think the details are kind of hazy at this point. I have to really go back and check my notes. I don't have them in front of me, but just from speaking to people on the Pittsburgh side, um, the Canucks were very much interested in, in offloading that contract, trying to find the cap flexibility that they had been searching for for so long. 
And that was their main motivation. It wasn't that they didn't like JT Miller. It was that they were really concerned about what their books looked like. And that was really where it was heading. I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, the ask was multiple first round picks. When you look at the Canucks and you mentioned them trying to get rid of cap space and, and alleviate some stress, where are they at right now? Because if they want to make a move and get better, they're ultimately going to have to try and get someone off that roster. So what is Jim Rutherford and Patrick Alvin and what kind of irons do they have on the fire right now? I was muted there. I'm getting a call. I actually need to jump on this. Um, but they're all over the place. They are looking at upgrades potentially to still look at the bottom six. I mentioned Brandon Duhame and his name out there. They're certainly keeping close tabs on him. And by the way, I do think there's a good chance that Duhame gets traded, even if the wild are in sell mode. And they're still obviously, as mentioned with Tanev, looking on that front as well to try and bolster this defense and get one more defenseman in the mix. Frank, you're the best. Thank you so much for this. Get on that call. See you guys. That was Frank Saravalli, our NHL insider. A lot of interesting stuff there from Frank. Um, yeah, the Elias Pettersson thing. It's it's just something that won't go away. And it's something that's not going to go away. Obviously, what was he said in the summer, and then he reiterated again in January, was basically, I'm not going to speak until... I don't want to talk about my contract until the season's over. However, the Canucks are a little bit ticked off in a sense where he hasn't basically come to them and been like, let's, let's chat here. Yeah. I I'm just at the point now where I'm not going to worry about this at all until the end of the season. Yeah. Right. Like, I don't think it's worth getting that worked up about. And, and look, of course the Canucks want this done sooner rather than, than later because it affects how they might approach the, the deadline in terms of future contracts. Like if you're adding a non-rental player, uh, or if you're thinking about acquiring a guy and who has a rental and then maybe wanting to extend him uh, beyond this season, you have to think about the cap math, but you can't map that out until you until you know what's going on with Pedersen. So, of course, the Canucks want that certainty, but it doesn't have to get done now. And, um, yeah, I'm just at the point now where I'm sick of talking about this. No, and, I agree. Uh I'm ready to just focus on this season and the success this team's having and worry about the rest later. Yeah. No, I mean, then the last thing on Patterson, obviously, is this season as he's having, right? He's going to score 30 goals. He's going to be another 30 goal score. This team's going to have three, you know, and they're going to have another guy in, in Niels Hoaglander that's going to get at least 25 goals. So an interesting conversation to have table in the summer. I do agree with Frank. There's no chance the Canucks are trading Elias Pedersen by the time the deadline comes around on March 8th. And it's going to be interesting to see what happens this summer with, you know, one of, if not the, their best player in Elias Pedersen harm. Now, uh, it's one of those things that we got to get to. It's the Mr. Lube under the hood harm. Yeah, so I found this interesting from last night's game. Tyler Myers played the most head-to-head -head minutes of any Canuck defenseman against Sidney Crosby. It was seven minutes and 16 seconds at five on five. In that sample, the Canucks were essentially break even in shots, chances, and, and the goals were 1-1, so they didn't get crushed. In fact, I would consider that, I don't know if I want to call it a success because there was also the penalty uh, that Myers took that led to the five on three um situation um as well but he held his own i think it's fair to say he didn't get annihilated even though there was the puck was in his feet uh on um on the first play where crosby then set up a raquel back door but it does interest it does open up an interesting conversation big picture about is this coaching staff looking to use myers sort of semi-consistently in this role against top uh, top players, similar to what a team like Tampa Bay, for example, would do uh, for many years when they had Ryan McDonough, Victor Hedman, and Mikhail Sergachev on the left side. They'd use McDonough in a shutdown role and say, even though Victor Hedman is our best defenseman, we want to use him in not sheltered minutes because he, still he was still playing quite often against um, some pretty good players, but free him up a little bit so that he's not consistent, consistently going up against the opposition's best offensive players. Uh, and throughout the season, we've seen a lot of experimentation. Some nights the Hughes and Heronic pair does go up against top lines. Yeah. Recently, it hasn't happened that frequently. And it does open up the conversation of going into the playoffs. Can you trust a Cole Myers pair, for instance, going up against Connor, Connor McDavid or going up against uh, Nathan McKinnon? 
Uh, that's one of uh, the interesting things that the Canucks internally are going to have to ask themselves ahead of the deadline as well. And I'm sure that's part of the reason that they have interest in Chris Tanev because that's another shutdown defender you can potentially use uh, in that um, in that type of capacity. Herm, that's great. That was under the hood. It's going to lead us to our next topic, brought to you by Mr. Lou, the pioneer of non-appointment warranty-approved oil change, now providing appointment-free tire service and sales. Find them at one of their 16 locations across the Lower Mainland. To find your nearest location, visit them online at mrlube.com. Interesting because you look at what Rick Tockett said yesterday after the game about when he went out and said, you know, JT Miller was good and you had other guys that weren't good and, and needed to be better. So I went in thinking that there was someone in, the, in, in their forward group that the lines were going to be changed at practice today. But instead, it was the D pairings that were moved around a bit. So basically, you have Juleson and Hronik switching spots. And what do you make of that? I think it's mostly about separating Zadorov and Juleson. They yeah. had a, a tough night against Pittsburgh. Uh, Canucks were outshot 10 to 3 at 5 on 5 with Zadorov on the ice. They had trouble moving the puck together, reading off of each other on Pittsburgh's tying goal, for example. It started with the sequence where Pedersen was carrying the puck into the offensive zone. He got funneled to the outside, tried passing the puck back to the point. I don't know if it deflected off something, but it was the puck was skipping in a spot where Zadorov couldn't hold the line. And Puck essentially ba- ended up back in the defensive zone. Pittsburgh, their speedy forecheck was hounding Zadorov and Juleson. Juleson couldn't move the puck. All of a sudden, the Canucks are hemmed on, um, on an extended shift, and the Penguins end up uh, scoring. We talked about in the Boston game how that was probably Zadorov's best game yeah. as a Canuck, but over this stretch of two, three weeks since the All-Star break, there have been a lot of highs and lows with Zdorov's game. And I think him and Juleson just haven't quite meshed as a partnership. So I think really that's what this is about is let's try some different combinations. They, for the most part, have not been working together. I think this is a good test to see if Philip Perona can drive his own pair. Well, that's going to be the biggest test, I think, to be completely honest. But like how much ice time is that pair really going to get if that's your third pairing, right? And I know and I know it's Philip Peronik and, and Nikita Zdorov, but... You're going to have Quinn and Juleson on the ice a lot. Your second pairing is going to be there with, with Tyler Myers and, and Ian Cole. So the ice time is going to have to be, is it going to be spread out as much? Or and when, they get into, when it gets into late games and is it, and it gets super tight, are they going to have to switch them up? Or is that what they're going to do? So it's an interesting concept to do if you're Rick Tockett. But when Susie comes back, okay, there's one guy that comes back. Just by looking at that defense harm, like they almost have to go out and get someone, don't they? Yeah. By the way, it's constructed. I mean, Mark Freeman's their their seventh defenseman. Yeah, I, I like the idea of adding another depth yeah. guy. I, I don't think it necessarily has to be a player of, let's say, Tanev or Walker's caliber where it's a legit top four upgrade because that's going to cost a lot. But yeah, could they add some depth? Sure. I I do think in relation to what you were saying about Zdorov and Hronik as a quote-unquote third pair, I don't think that's a big like a big talking point just because i expect that it'll be the quinn hughes pair and then and then the next two pairs are i expect them to play relatively balanced even minutes and i think that's been the theme for a big chunk of the season is that you don't have a huge divide between the second and third pair it's more the top pair and then a relatively even bottom four and i think that's consistent with um with the way that they've construct constructed the pairs right now. Uh, the, the other aspect is of course, when you pair Juleson with Hughes, now all of a sudden Juleson doesn't have to worry about moving. Puck, <laughs> yeah. Right. That's been stay home defenseman as he's fallen back down to earth. Juleson since I want to say the last couple weeks, uh, maybe going back to the Winnipeg game, for instance, yeah, occasionally there's been one or two situations where he's been caught out of position, but it's mostly been his puck play. It's mostly been his turnovers that have been spotty that have led to some shifts where they get hemmed in. Well, if you're playing with Quinn Hughes, take that off his plate. Now he's just worried worried about blocking shots, defending well. Uh, it simplifies the game for Juleson, and I think that's maybe the hope is can that – help Juleson get back to the level right before the stretch where he's playing excellent hockey. The potential risk, of course, is, well, Hughes and Hronik are so great together offensively. Do you take something away from 
Uh, Hughes' offensive ceiling if you pair him with a more limited player with the puck in uh, in Juleson, but uh, we'll see. I don't mind uh, the experimentation just because Zdorov Juleson were the were the weak links on the back end. Yeah, I mean it's an interesting one to it's an interesting concept to have if you're the Vancouver Canucks. I mean, it's a good problem that you're this good, you bank this many points, so you can tinker with your lineup, you can tinker with your power play, you can tinker with everything because you know you're in the back of your mind, you know. It's all about getting ready for game one of the playoffs in, in, in all reality, right? You're going to win some games here. You're probably going to finish at the top of your, your division unless you absolutely tank. And I don't really see the Canucks doing that over the course of the way their schedule works out. They've got so many home games coming up as well. So it's an interesting concept. Good problem to have for Rick Tockett to be able to go and do that, though. Definitely. One other thing I wanted to touch on from the Pittsburgh game is we need to see more from Lysland. Yep. If he's in a third line center role, he's. Didn't have the tough matchups in that game. He wasn't going up against Crosby. Their line Miller got, got killed. a lot of, yeah. Miller got a lot of Cro- uh, Crosby and and did well. Uh, I was also talking to Thomas Drance about this. Miller took nine defensive zone draws <laughs> at five on five. So it's not as if Lindholm was this. Okay, don't worry about offense. Just take a lot of D zone draws. Be responsible defensively. If you're in that third line role as Elias Lindholm and you've got a- at least one really established good line mate in Connor Garland. Your responsibility is either you got to take the hard defensive minutes and free up JT or like in the Pittsburgh game, if you're not being fed those hard minutes and you're in a more sheltered uh, third line role where you're seeing a lot of Pittsburgh's bottom six, you got to crush it offensively. And that's where the Canucks didn't register a single five on five shot on goal with, with Lindholm on the ice at five on five. They were outshot nine, nothing. The chances scoring chances were five to one in Pittsburgh's favor. That third line needs to start going. They weren't noticeable at all in the Pittsburgh game. Time for anyone else harm. It's <laughs> time for, like you said, anyone else uh, brought to you by DoorDash, it's our listeners' chance to get involved and hit us up in the YouTube live chat. And it's also our listeners' chance chance to get 25% off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more when they download the DoorDash app and enter code NATION25. Offer valid in Canada, subject to change terms apply. Karen says, when Susie is back, who do you bench or who do you take out from the decor? Who comes out? Right now, that's a tough question. It's really going to depend, I think, in part on who's hot at the moment, right? Yeah. Because right now, I think you could make the case for Noah Juleson mm-hmm. um, just because of his um, his play has taken a bit of a, a bit of a dip. But if you had asked this two weeks ago, I don't think he could have taken Noah Juleson out of no. that. He would have gotten Nikita Zadorov. Uh, ultimately, I do think right now the debate would probably be between Zadorov and Juleson, maybe Ian Cole, but... The fact that Rick Tockett is trusting him alongside Tyler Myers to go up against Sidney Crosby in that game tells you that he's up um, up the depth chart a little bit compared to Zadorov and Juleson. I think the debate comes down to those two. And if you want to make a case for the opposite, to play devil's advocate, for Juleson to stay in the lineup and it to maybe be uh, a Nikita Zadorov, um, it would mostly just be handedness, right? That Juleson's a right shot. And if you're bringing Susie in for... Juleson, then the conversation is, okay, which left-handed defender is going to play the right side? And that's something that this coaching staff hasn't necessarily loved the concept of. What way do you lean? Game one of the playoffs, Rick Tockett has his whiteboard in front of him, and he's coaching to win hockey games. I think right now, if game one was tomorrow, he would take Nikita Zorov out of the lineup. I, I I really do. Yeah. I think that that's just the way we go. And then they would figure it out from there. I think that the way that Juleson's played, obviously he's come back down to earth a little bit, but I think that, you know, he's stable enough and has that stability where, you know, there's not going to be too many mistakes. I just think that, you know, Zadorov, as much as we said that the Boston game was probably his best game as a Canuck. I think if he was, if he was deciding right now and the game was tomorrow, it'd be Zadorov that came out. Juleson does also have an edge in terms yeah. of penalty killing impact over Zadorov. So that is an interesting, um, Thought process because looking at forgetting the D pairs today, <laughs> normally we have Hughes and Ronick together. Let's assume game one of the playoffs, they're together. Right now, you have Cole Myers. You'd think that Susie probably hops into that second pair role alongside, um, alongside Myers, Myers. Uh, which allows you to bump down Cole to the third pair. And then 
yeah, I mean, it it would be either Zadorov Cole or Cole Juleson. Juleson. And uh, as much as um, you could make the case that Zadorov is a better player than Juleson, we've seen how reluctant this coaching staff has been to use left-handed defensemen on the right side. And with the P- PK impact, you could just as easily see Cole uh, Juleson. Yeah, I mean, it's a... It's a good problem to have again if you're Rick Talkett, be able to have the opportunity and and the depth ish to be able to go and do that. Um, another one out, Captain Canuck. Was the Lindy trade a mistake? And can we blame Quads? LOL. Yeah, so Quads was uh, pumping the Elias Lindholm. Uh, um, was was on the Lindholm train for a long time. I think it's too early to say it was a mistake. It's only been 12 games. Give him some time to settle. Yeah, the Canucks need more, uh, but. What he does in April, once the playoffs start, matters way more than what he does on the stretch. Yeah. That's ultimately what's going to um, determine how we look back at this trade. The rest of the regular season is more about experimenting to find his right fit because we've seen him on Pedersen's wing. We, we saw him for a few games towards the first road trip on Miller's wing. We've seen him in a third-line center role. They're going to keep tinkering until they find that right fit. That's what this regular what the rest of the regular season is for is to make sure he finds his right fit yeah and i think the lindholm thing you got to cut him so a little bit of slack found out about the trade on a plane back when you landed from cabo had the road had the went to the all-star game had the road trip came back went on another road trip pretty sure he's still living in a hotel right now he's gonna figure some stuff out here over the weekend but um it's just been a whirlwind for him so they have some games at the end of the mar- at the end of March where they're nine straight at home. I kind of want to see what he does in that stretch where there's just you know so obviously has some stability in his life as well. Um, there's one m- more thing I wanted to add when even when we did see Lindholm and Pedersen together, which is the fit that I think a lot of us were thinking would click. It is worth noting that Pedersen wasn't at his best when those two were together, and the thought process behind that partnership relies on Pedersen being an elite playmaker to set up Lindholm. That partnership isn't necessarily about Lindholm driving play. It's about Lindholm finding ways to get open in the high slot um, and thriving off of Pedersen's high danger chances or high danger passes. We didn't see um, that level of offensive creativity. Pedersen hasn't been, I think, at the uh, at the peak of his game since the All-Star break. So that, I think, is an interesting um, factor to look for, too, if Tockett goes back to Pedersen and Lindholm, is we need to see Pedersen at his, at his best too. That's the other half of the equation in uh, Lindholm clicking in the top six. Yeah. And I think that that's just something that they're going to have time to do here down the stretch. I mean, I know Rick Talkett said today that, you know, PD was, it takes practices a little bit lighter so he can be ready for games. And that's going to be something that they're going to need to do down the stretch run as well. Uh, Ty David, are the Canucks trying to showcase Baines to turn him into a trade chip? I really don't know why I read that. No, no. I mean, who who else would you want in that role, right? Yeah, it's um, he deserved a, a call up. I think we're at the point now where if you're going to play in a top nine role, you need some offensive output. I think the Colorado game was probably his most impactful <laughs> his best in, game, yeah. in driving chances. Yeah, he's responsible defensively. And, you know, at this point that he's not going to make a lot of mistakes that has legitimate value. It it uh, gives him an edge over Alinus Carlson, for example, who was called up. Only got nine, ten minutes, uh, uh, nine, nine to ten minutes per game. Didn't have the same level of uh, of trust with Rick Tockett that Baines has. But yeah, if you're going to play in a third line role, at some point they're going to need some offense out of him. That has nothing to do with showcasing him for a trade. Though. No, absolutely not. I totally agree with you on that, uh, Grady. We have one from Facebook as well. Is there a potentially a chance that Pedersen does not want to handcuff the team with a huge contract? Maybe he just wants to fit in and build a dynasty. That's from Steve Dick. Players are going to get paid. Players should get paid. Superstar players in this league are going to get paid. I don't think Elias Pedersen is going to is going to take a discount here. I don't think no. it's going to happen. I don't think he should. I think that when you are as an elite level of an athlete as you are, and this is your first massive contract, you're going to go get your bag. Definitely. I. I... I'm not, there's 0% <laughs> chance yeah. in my mind that he's going to take a discount. No. And I mean, first of all, to build a dynasty, you have to win and at least get, make it through a round of the playoffs first or a couple rounds and get to the Western conference final and, and, and do all that. But um, yeah, no, Elias Pedersen is definitely going to get his money as he should. And it's going to be a talking point again, over the course of, of a very long time um, as, until it gets sorted to be completely honest. Uh, Grady, you got one for us? Nope. That was it. 
All right. Well, that's great. That's another one of those any anyone, any times. Um, now I guess we can go to one of our favorite segments is when I get to pick a bet and y'all laugh at me because the one I picked yesterday, the Dallas Stars got absolutely smoked. So let's try this again. It's time for our Betway Bet of the Day brought to you by Betway, Betway, and yes, Betway. Give me the New York Rangers on the money line at home tonight and over five and a half goals plus 120, 125 for one of the league's best teams harm. They're home tonight. You must be 19 plus to play if you choose to play. Please play responsibly. If you get this wrong, I think you have to uh, text quads before tomorrow's show and rely on his vibes meter. Quads also, the first time I did this show, said that his bet of the day was the Canucks were going to win the Stanley Cup. <laughs> okay, okay, listen. You've got to distinguish, though, because half of his bets are joke bets. The, you know, I think that that was a vet that he was very happy about. Okay. I would have to he get him on one day. Homer, so I, 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 I am, trust it. me, I'm well aware of but that. But like, I've seen Phil Pronick for Norris bets by quads. I've seen JT Miller for Hart. Oh, he's tweeting it. He's quads. on that. He's on that campaign hard. I've seen Mariners for a World Series. Just these outlandish bets where I'm like, you may as well just burn ten dollars at that point. But when he's picking individual games, like he's picked. San Jose Shark victories over um, like when, when they're playing like I think it was a game against the Rangers or some other yeah actual when they beat contender. Them. I think he nailed a Chicago win. Yeah, <laughs> he's when it comes to single game bets, maybe outside of the Canuck, Canuck bets because yeah. he just bets the Canucks every time because yeah. he's a huge homer. But out of market bets, his vibes have been pretty decent this year. Well, do you remember the World Junior bets? He had Lakaramaki to lead ah, yeah. the World Juniors in scoring, and this guy put like significant money down and won a couple of racks on it too so the wow. vibes can be high vibes can be high as long as your guys come through i mean look there's certain players that you don't ever bet against and you look at other sports i'm probably not betting against patrick holmes anymore never bet against tom <laughs> brady right and you look at some of the teams in this league like nathan mckinnon he's probably not getting under three shots for any game the rest of the season all the way down but anyways i digress it's it's an interesting one uh harm thanks for doing this with me again uh Canucks conversation. We will be back at it tomorrow. Looking forward to it. Game day. First one of the season. Finally against the LA Kings for the Vancouver Canucks. So it should be a good one. Canucks conversation with Harmon and quads brought to you by the Toyota BZ4X. The BZ4X is fresh. Look is just an added bonus to its range since you can drive up to 406 kilometers on a single charge. That's enough to get you from Kitsilano to Whistler or Kamloops to Kelowna and back and still be home in time for the game. Now that's what we'd call electric the best part by choosing electric you can get up to eleven thousand dollars in rebates and incentives the bz4x are in stock and selling quickly so make sure to visit shoptoyota.ca or your local pacific toyota dealer to get your hands on one canucks conversation is live monday through friday every weekday at 2 p.m over on the canucks army youtube channel make sure you like subscribe and interact in the youtube live chat every day with us folks